o'clock news starts right now. New video tonight out of Pleasanton. Firefighters called to a deadly RV fire early this morning. That right there was on Jeff Street. The Pleasanton Fire Department says that they managed to put out the flames in under seven minutes, but crews did make a disturbing discovery. A woman found dead inside of an RV. Right now, the cause of the fire is still under investigation. Definitely some scary sights there. Now, a pet store who sells puppies from breeders will have to close its doors in New Braunfels after city council passed an ordinance prohibiting the buying and selling of pets from breeders. But, you know, this is something that San Antonio has experienced. We passed a similar ordinance in the city back in 2020. Quesas Camelia Juarez tells us what the pet store in New Braunfels is planning to do next. The item is approved 4-3. Animal activists applauded after city council voted four to three to prohibit pet stores from buying and selling cats or dogs from commercial breeding facilities. Although no business is named in the ordinance, Puppyland is the only store in New Braunfels impacted. In a statement, Puppyland owner Justin Kerr says these draconian policies limit choice and create an unsavory black market. Animal activists, including William Stapleton from the Humane Society, says shelters have seen an increase of 175 dogs than the year prior and doesn't want to see more dogs brought into the community. A lot of shelters are as full as we are, even up north. Puppyland says it feels targeted and wants to ensure the public that it only buys from licensed breeders. In their statement, they continue to say, Puppyland is committed to ethical and humane treatment of animals. We do not source from puppy meals, and we are committed to our customers for the lifetime of their forever friend. New Braunfels requires pet stores to keep a record of the pets they get from shelters for one year and keep a record of the sales. The city of San Antonio is putting the clamps on information from the Eric Cantu shooting investigation. In a letter sent to the Texas Attorney General's office today, city officials asked permission to withhold a wide range of records from the original shooting report to body camera footage that hasn't been released. It should be pointed out that state law requires law enforcement agencies to release the basic information on police incidents. The 17-year-old Cantu was shot multiple times on October 2nd by SAPD officer James Brennan in a McDonald's parking lot. Brennan was fired for violating department policies, then arrested on multiple felony charges of aggravated assault by a public servant. Cantu survived the shooting, but remains in the hospital. And San Antonio police say a man went on the attack with a knife, stabbing members of his own family, including two young children. So all of this happened last night on the east side. And as Katrina Weber reports, the man also ended up in the hospital after he was stabbed and shot. There is no time to waste for people in pain. A 31-year-old woman and her two children all stabbed in an attack in their own home in the 500 block of Burleson. Outside in the parking lot, police also found a man bleeding, both from stab wounds and from being shot. All people stabbed were transported to a hospital. From what we know right now, what we believe to happen is that the, the male is the suspect. Police say the 33-year-old suspect is the woman's husband and the father of the children, a four-year-old girl and five-year-old boy. They say the boy was left in critical condition. Officers found all of them after answering a call at the Olive Park Apartments around three this morning. Still a lot of details are coming through, so we don't know exactly what took place that led up to this incident. Although police are calling this a case of family violence, it appears that this is affecting many other families here. A lot of them have children, and some of them told us that this has them worried. The search for evidence also affected more than one home. Police spent time going through the family's apartment and the one next door, but they would not say why they focused on the neighbor's home. In fact, police left a lot of questions unanswered, saying their investigation was just beginning. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. The loss of a little boy known for his big smile and laugh has his parents motivated to inspire others to support a local center focusing on helping children fight heart diseases. Little Ezra was born in 2021 with a congenital heart defect. Thanks to screenings done before he was born, doctors were ready with a plan of action to treat him. After two surgeries, Ezra was on his way to having a healthy heart, but sadly, after his first birthday, he was diagnosed with cancer, passed away more than a month ago. 
His parents are channeling their grief into purpose by supporting tomorrow's Children's Heart Foundation walk. We want Ezra to leave a legacy uh, helping other families if he can, even just by getting the word out, but just extending our gratitude as well for everything that the Children's Heart Center has done here. Ezra's parents formed a team of 30 of their family and friends to take part in tomorrow's Children's Heart Walk happening at the San Antonio Zoo. Proceeds raised to fund research used in the treatment of congenital heart diseases in children. Baby Ezra. Switching gears now, we're waiting to find out how $400 million in state funding is going to be used to make schools safer across Texas. Governor Greg Abbott's office announced that funding yesterday, but here's the thing. It's unclear right now as to how that money is going to be divided. The state is transferring roughly $900 million toward public safety initiatives. 15 million of that will go to Uvalde to help build a new school after the shooting at Robb Elementary. 400 million will be spread out among school districts statewide to strengthen security. The Equity Center out of Austin is watching how the money will be split. The group is a nonprofit that works with more than 600 Texas school districts and the legislature to fight for equitable funding. It really doesn't make a lot of sense, in my opinion, in our opinion, to distribute it evenly to every campus, to every district, and then every campus in the state when needs vary so much. Now, you've got some campuses that are going to be built within the last few years that are going to have far fewer needs than those old campuses. After the deadly school shooting at Santa Fe High School outside of Houston, the Texas legislature created the school safety allotment. $50 million are set aside for school safety each school year for districts statewide. It's distributed on a per student basis. They look at the total amount appropriated, divide that by the number of students, and you get $9.72 per student. We believe that's the wrong way to do this because school safety really isn't a per student issue. It's a campus-based issue. You have to make sure the campus is safe. Whether or not they've got bulletproof glass at their entrance vestibules, uh, whether or not they've got sufficient door locks, just some very basic things. That's not a per student issue. The Equity Center plans to work with Texas lawmakers in the upcoming legislative session in January to change that funding mechanism, making it campus, not student based. And we, of course, are going to keep tabs on how that latest 400 million is going to split uh, be split among schools. But then after that, that leaves 500 million. 400 million of that is going to go toward efforts along the border for Operation Lone Star. And then $100 million is earmarked to go toward the state's COVID-19 response. All right. We've been getting you ready for it all month long. The 10th annual Dia de los Muertos Fest kicks off tomorrow. Alicia Barrera joins us live from Hemisphere with a look at what we can expect. Alicia, I know you got a lot of stuff to tell us. Yeah, so, I mean, just think about it. 10 years, right? That's what we're selling here with celebrating with Muertos Fest. That means that more people at home are celebrating and taking part of this beautiful tradition. And this year, 80 altars, one of them the community altar. And I want you to invite, invite you to come out here and maybe put a picture of your loved one. Bring an ofrenda for them if you don't have time or space to make it in your home. It doesn't have to be big, but you have a space here. And Mariana Vasquez is one of the, the women who puts this together, specifically the community altar. She's from San Antonio, but she's been in New York for some years. What are the aspects that you are wanting to highlight here at this community altar? Well, this year, I'd like to really focus on reflection yeah. and, ex and reflection in the traditional sense. So I'm doing a little bit more of a rustic approach with the approach being that we all have someone that we miss, that we love, a pet, who we want to celebrate and honor and be thankful that we even had them in our lives at all. Absolutely. So you can see that there is the traditional um, element of the Sempasuchi, which is what leads your ancestors and your antepasados to find you through the fragrance of their petals coming in from Mictlan. They're thirsty, we have water. There's always the element of representation of the spirit for the, the the, the tequilita, the yeah. Mexican chocolate, the pan de muerto, the canela, the chiles, when it's the green jalapeno versus to where it's been a, try, a dry uh, chile yeah. and representing uh, our cuisine Perfect. and the tradition of, you know, those recipes that are ancient. And it's beautiful to have it showcased here in this in this way. Mariana, thank you so much for enlightening us a little bit. So I want to invite you, if you come out here tomorrow, starting at 10 a.m., bring a picture, bring an ofrenda, and just soak this culture, this tradition in. Back to you guys. 
Good stuff. Looks like so much fun out there. We can't wait to go there tomorrow. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, thank you. All right. Now, here's a live look outside I-10 at Frio, where, yeah, the commute's going pretty slowly uh, there. It looks like it's headed toward uh, the downtown area. You expect this on a Friday, 6.09 right now. Looks a little uh, better than 5 o'clock. But it still looks better than 5 o'clock, but still a little congested out there. Maybe give it another hour. Yeah, things exactly. Things a lot better. A lot of sunshine out there. Beautiful blue sky after the uh, very welcomed rain earlier this morning. Here's what we're contending with right now. Some gusty winds, noticeable winds. You'll feel them if you're going to Friday night football or trunk or treat somewhere out this evening. Winds gusting most recently between 20 and 25 miles per hour, but I think we could still get a few gusts up to 30, maybe even 35 miles per hour here and there. And we'll be dealing with the gusty wind through the night tonight and even the day tomorrow. Right now we're at 70 degrees. We'll be down in the 50s by 10 o'clock. We'll talk more about how cool it's going to be this weekend, especially tomorrow morning and our next chance of rain. It's just around the corner. We're not asking to build new grand facilities. We're not trying to build any monuments. We're just trying to create space so that these kids can learn. It's more than a want, but a need. Welder ISD is making a multi-million dollar request to the people who live there. How its students are now getting involved. Plus, five major events, one day, and what's expected to be a whole lot of traffic. The busy weekend that residents and visitors can expect downtown, and also what you can do to get around the potential mess that is tonight on the Night Beat. So yeah, you want to pay really close attention to what we're going to, what the weather's going to be like hour by hour because there are so many events going on this week and Muertos Fest. I can't games. wait. Yeah, we got Muertos Fest, Elton John at the Alamo Dome. Oh, that's right. We got a music and music festival, and then we also got a wine. I know you like wine. Wine yes, tasting and I food do. festival, and the weather's going to be great. Yeah. But it won't stay that way into next week. Yeah, we will have some changes into next week. Some actually good beneficial changes into next week, but this weekend is going to be very fall like and comfortable for the outdoor activities. We do need more rain though. It's nice to see the rain this morning. Here's our next chance. Take a look at it. it comes on Tuesday. So we'll get through the weekend and we'll get through Halloween dry. But I do want to point out late Monday night on Halloween, we could see a few showers start to kick off, but I do think trick or treating right now looks dry. Okay, so I just updated these numbers. 2022 is still the driest year to date. So from January 1st to October 28th, this is still the driest year for that time frame. but we gained a lot of ground early this morning. We're competing with 1917. This is not a record I want to stay. This isn't a first place position I want to stay in. We're at 9.23 inches. 1917 had 9.33 year to date. I think we could surpass it by Tuesday. Hey, Floresville picked up 1.4. Officially at the airport, 0.37. Bernie just under an inch. New Braunfels about four tenths of an inch. Elmendorf nine tenths of an inch, Helotus about six tenths of an inch. Obviously wide ranging rainfall accumulations as is often the case. And here's a look at the cold front with the showers and storms that moved through earlier today or early really this morning is when they moved through affecting the morning commute. Boom, in and out pretty quickly. The fast moving, if it was slower, of course we would have picked up more rain. That's where we're seeing the steadier rain in North Texas higher and more substantial accumulations, two inches plus in parts of North and East Texas because there it's a little more prolonged there. Here's the upper level system. You see that counterclockwise swirl in the upper level flow. That's moving on out of town, but it's going to be replaced by another upper level system that's going to be dropping in for the early part of next week. That's going to be coming into basically northern Mexico and West Texas on Monday, Halloween, and then by Tuesday starts to throw some energy our way and we should have enough moisture to work with to kickstart some scattered activity. I do think the future cast here Tuesday 2 p.m. is a little on the aggressive side. We may not see quite this much coverage, but about 40% is what we're anticipating, at least as of now. Of course, we'll be getting more information and more data and we'll be fine tuning the forecast in the days ahead. 72, that was our high temperature today after a low of 62. So just a 10 degree jump there today. That's it. The average high is 78 and we're going to be below that tomorrow than pretty close to it as we get into Sunday. Overall, just very fall like this weekend. 70 degrees right now, dew point of 49, dry air back in place. Northwesterly wind, we can thank for that drier air and that lack of humidity. It's steady at 13 miles per hour, most recent gust 
up to 22 and we're going to be contending with that wind for the rest of the night and even throughout most of the day tomorrow. Some 60s already, so if you're headed outdoors, trunk or treat, Friday night football, have the long sleeves or a light jacket, 60s already in just north and west of San Antonio. Comfort 68, Bandera 67, Bulverde just updated to 66 and 71 on the west side at Port SA. And these temperatures will be falling off pretty efficiently here this evening, and I think by 10 o'clock we'll be down in the upper 50s. 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, upper 40s in the hill country, Rock Springs, Junction, Kerrville, 48 degrees, low 50s around San Antonio, downtown 53 degrees, Converse 52, Timberwood Park about 50 along with Castroville. So that nice crisp fall feel in the morning and in the afternoon. I mean, we're just going to make it into the lower 70s. So 73, the high temperature in and around most of San Antonio, but even some upper 60s in the hill country. A mixture of sun and clouds, especially to start the day, but by the afternoon, I think mostly sunny. Northwesterly wind steady at 10 to 20 miles per hour with some gusts potentially up to 30 at times. And then Sunday, not nearly as windy. You're not going to notice the wind. Actually, Sunday morning, we should be calm enough where we may just have some patchy morning fog, something to keep in mind if you're venturing out early on Sunday morning around sunrise. By the afternoon, up mid to upper 70s and nothing but sunshine all day. A light northwesterly wind at 5 to 10 miles per hour. There you go, Monday, Halloween, 77 the high, mostly cloudy. For trick-or-treating, I'm thinking temperatures falling through the down through the 70s with low humidity, so really any costume should be pretty comfortable. And then Tuesday is when we see that next storm chance. But again, we're watching for the potential of a little bit of rain developing late Monday night, something you'll have to check back in with us about. Yeah, we definitely want to break that mm -hmm. 1917 record. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. All right, Adam. Thank you. The trick or treat forecast looking pretty good. Now in for another treat out in Poteet. I'm a poet. I didn't even know it, Andrew. What do you got <laughs> going for us right now? Well, I, I can tell you Adam was talking about contending with the wind. That's what we've been doing, and I've only been out here for about 30 minutes. I can tell you Poteet's going to have their hands full today with Crystal City. As Poteet tries to right their ship, when we come back, we'll hear from the Aggies on their season so far. Plus, Trinity Tigers about to taste the take, or excuse me, take on their toughest test of the season on the road this weekend. Got that too next. Aggie football is everything, the community, our family, our friends. We just do this for everybody here in Poteet. We're going to play with heart no matter what and play for the community and our friends and everybody and all together. Poteet football is certainly a community effort, and the Aggies are excited to return home in big board sports. Good afternoon and welcome to Aggie Stadium, where Poteet football has a chance to do something they haven't done in well over a decade, and that's secure a third straight winning season. The Aggies are currently 5-3 overall, 2-1 in District 14-3A Division 1, and deadlock with Catula and Hondo in the district standings with two games left to play. Poteet has already defeated Catula two weeks ago, and they'll face Hondo next week in their regular season finale. But the Aggies are entirely focused on the present. After suffering their first district loss of the season, a 46-0 road loss to Jordanton last week, Week. Poteet wants to right the ship tonight against Crystal City. It's a really, it's a really important game for us to bounce back and get our confidence back up for playoffs and get ready for that. It's our bounce back game from last week. We have a lot to prove. We're going to go in just like every other game, expect the best and just go dominate our game plan. There's good news on that front. The Aggies have won their last two matchups against Crystal City, 55-7 in 2021 and 35-7 in 2019. This year, they bring a little something extra to the game. Confidence and resilience forged over the trials and tribulations of the season up till this point. From every game we've played, we've gotten a lot better and we have become more more mature and a lot better team. Teams in past and Poteet, um, if, they, if, they've, if they've dealt with the adversity we've had to deal with, would have shut down and we would have been a 3-2, three, 3-win three team and they would have shut down. What we have is strong, hard-nosed kids that believe in us and we believe in them. You know, we tell everybody every day you got to pass the four-way test. You know, coaches trust coaches, coaches trust players, players trust players, and players trust coaches. All the way around, everybody trusts everybody. You know, there's never been a moment where, you know, we linger or we think that we're not in it or we can't do it. And, and if we do that every week, we're going to be fine, and that's why we preach it so hard. 
Photographer Eddie Latigo and I will begin the road trip tonight in Poteet, then head to Pleasanton where the Eagles host Floresville, and we end the night in Charlotte as the Trojans take on Brackett. In college football, the Trinity Tigers are currently 7-0, 4-0 in conference play. And oh, by the way, that means they've won 16 straight regular season games dating back to last season. This weekend, Trinity takes, uh, takes on one of their toughest tests of the season, a road matchup against Center College, who is 5-2. But ultimately, it hasn't mattered who Trinity is facing, whether it's a nationally ranked team or a team that's struggling. The Tigers approach every game the same way. We haven't looked ahead. We've taken every game with immense respect. And, um, you know, when you're undefeated, you control your destiny as long as you keep winning. And right now, that's, that's kind of how we look at it, as long as we just take care of business every single day, whether it's in practice, the film room, on the field, as long as we just keep pushing, come out with 100% effort, then um, we have a good chance at the end of the day. Trinity takes on center tomorrow at noon. The playoffs are finally here for San Antonio FC. The Alamo City Club begins their playoff run as the top seed in the USL Championship with home field advantage throughout the playoffs. Their opponent tonight is seven-seeded Oakland Roots SC, who took down second-seeded San Diego last week. But SAFC will have a packed house tonight at Toyota Field to help them on their quest for their title. That just speaks a lot to the fans that we have, speaks a lot to the organization, and that, you know, the fans are behind us, you know, and that they're... They're ready to see us get three points, so I, I think that's a that's a great thing to have. Toyota Field playoff nights are something special. Last year was incredible. The it was two or three games that we had, so we're expecting the same thing. It's a it's a rowdy crowd. It's a passionate crowd, and uh, you know hopefully we can uh, put on a good performance, and it'll be a good night for the city of San Antonio. The theme tonight is blackout. I'm wearing black in support of San Antonio FC. Hopefully they can pick up the dub. But also, just breaking a couple minutes ago, my, my producer, Mike Klein, just informed me that the Spurs have waived guard Joshua Primo. Obviously, this is breaking as we speak, so we're going to have more on this coming up later tonight. And the, obviously, all the rest of the highlights from a great night and big game coverage coming up tonight on the night beat. From Poteet, live, oh, Andrew Seeley, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank it's you, It's big Andrew. information as they have a, a game against the Bulls tonight at 7. 7.30, right? 7.30, 7.30. Yeah. All right. You we'll can tune right. in early. We'll be right back after this. Democrats are pulling out all the stops in hopes of getting voters excited ahead of Election Day. So today they have former President Barack Obama headlining an event in Georgia. And this is coming as Republicans are pushing to upend the narrow Democratic majorities in both the House and Senate. ABC's M. Wynn has the latest from Washington. With just 11 days to go into the midterm elections, Senate races nationwide are neck and neck. In Georgia, Senate incumbent Democrat Raphael Warnock in a dead heat with Republican challenger Herschel Walker. Democrats calling in their biggest star, former President Barack Obama, hoping to entice voters to the polls. I'm running for re-election not because I'm in love with politics, but because I'm in love with change. Top Republican leaders rallying and defending the former NFL star after a second woman came forward, claiming Walker pressured and paid for her to have an abortion. Walker, a staunch opponent to abortion, denying all allegations. They can't take me down because I'm a bad man. I can tell you that right now. Walker's latest scandal not deterring his base. Has no bearing with me at all. That unwavering support appearing to cause concern with top Democrats. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer caught on an open mic. Schumer's office playing cleanup, saying he does believe the Democratic candidates across the board will win. And in Pennsylvania, it's Democrats' best chance to take a Republican seat, though polls show the initial lead Democrat John Fetterman had over Republican Mehmet Oz is closing. Now I'm going to fight for everyone in Pennsylvania who ever got knocked down. My opponent, John Fetterman, has argued that we should decriminalize all drugs. The other key races polls show are still a toss-up, Arizona, Nevada, and Wisconsin. President Biden is back in Philadelphia tonight, delivering remarks at a fundraiser for the Pennsylvania Democratic Party. M1, ABC News, Washington. Around America tonight, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband expected to be okay after surviving a hammer attack this morning inside of his family's home. A spokesman for the speaker says that the attacker is now in custody. Nancy Pelosi was in Washington when the attack took place. And right now, the FBI and San Francisco police are investigating what happened. Now, so far, there's no word on a motive. We don't know why this person did that. 
Paul Pelosi, who's 82 years old, is expected to make a full recovery. Authorities in St. Louis are trying to figure out how the gunman who killed two people at a school on Monday was able to get a hold of a weapon. It's because police say the alleged shooter, 19-year-old Orlando Harris, was flagged by FBI by an FBI background check. Authorities add Harris's mother contacted them when she found out her son was in possession of an AR-15 type rifle he got from a private seller. Missouri doesn't have a red flag law that allows police to take an individual's gun who is deemed to be a potential risk to others. Police say officers had arranged to have the rifle given to a third party, but Harris ended up using the gun during Monday's shooting, killing a teacher and a student. Harris then died after a gunfight with police. The Santa Fe County District Attorney now officially reviewing the investigative report on the fatal shooting from the Rust movie set from last year. You remember that. The Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office turned its final report over to the district attorney. Cinematographer Helena Hutchins was shot and killed when a prop gun reportedly held by actor Alec Baldwin was fired. The movie's director was also shot but survived. The DA's office says it's going to thoroughly review the information to make a, quote, thoughtful, timely decision about whether to bring charges. Hutchins' family recently reached a settlement in a civil lawsuit with Alec Baldwin and Rust Movie Productions, LLC. The House Ways and Means Committee could soon get a look at former President Donald Trump's tax returns. A federal appeals court declined Trump's request yesterday to hold up the release. This clears the way for lawmakers to receive the documents in one week. The Democratic-led House has been trying to see years of financial records related to the former president, especially his tax returns. But Trump's legal team could appeal the ruling to the U.S. Supreme Court. At this point, attorneys for Trump have not said if they plan to do that. And just ahead, tributes are pouring in as the world of rock and roll loses a legend and a pioneer. Also, Tom Brady and Giselle Boonshin officially done. The details coming up in today's bus. But coming up next, we're heading back to Hemisphere as last minute preparations are underway for this year's Muertos Fest. We're checking in with our Alicia Barrera, who's live and breaking down a jam packed weekend of food, music, fashion, and memories happening in downtown San Antonio. All right, it's almost time for the crowds to pack Hemisphere for the 10th anniversary of Muertos Fest. Families and friends will be honored. Uh, those who have passed on will be honored in a celebration event in a true San Antonio style. And this is a San Antonio as it gets, baby. And in addition to all the ofrendas, the Dia de los Muertos celebration also involves food, music, and come on, just a good time. Alicia Barrera is joining us now live from Hemisphere with the preview. She's been walking around, talk to, talking to us about what we should expect tomorrow, the jewelry, but tell us what else we should check out. All right, and before what I tell you what you need to check out, how you need to dress, dress comfortably because there's a lot to walk through. And the first thing that you wanna look out for are gonna be those marigold arches there. Those flowers are gonna signify kind of a row of altars throughout hemisphere. So come with your camera prepared. You're gonna see a lot of beautiful ones. Some you'll walk and you know stare, and then other ones you can actually walk into, like this one of Casa Mio, the Familia Garcia, and they're honoring their mother, their grandparents, great grandparents, and really they're talking about the gratitude to their roots, to their raices. So they're really honing into that, and you can see it. A garden has come to life hour by hour here at Hemisphere. And that's really what these families have created to honor their loved ones. So again, 10 years ago, Muertos Fest started with 20 altars, then about 50 every year. And now we're talking about 80 altars. So what a beautiful way to share our tradition with those who are from here, from San Antonio and people traveling from out of our city. So some people have been traveling from Harlingen, which is about three, four hours away. So miles away to come here to celebrate with us. It kicks off tomorrow at 10 a.m. It's completely free, but we talked about it. Bring your wallets because there are going to be a lot of beautiful pieces of our culture to purchase and take home, hang on your wall, wear as jewelry. And then of course, for the, t for the kids at Yanaguana, they're gonna have storytelling and music for the children. That's 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. We have all the details listed on ksat.com. We'll see you tomorrow for Muertos Fest. Yeah, there's something for everybody to do, and I love that. If you go there and you don't have a good time, I, I don't know what to we tell got you. got altars, you got the food, you got the cool jewelry with the special meaning. Yep. What's Music, a procession, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, 68 degrees out there right now.
And it's just lovely, Adam. Not you can't a really cloud. Complain. Not a cloud. Yeah, you know, we went from the rain this morning yes. to not a cloud in the sky right now and a mostly clear night. It's just cool and breezy out there this evening. You notice the gusty winds. So we're near 70 at the moment. By 10 o'clock, we'll be down into the upper 50s and early tomorrow morning, pretty close to 50 degrees to start today. Notice that northwesterly wind steady at 13 miles per hour. At times, it's gusting between 20 and 30. And we'll be contending with that through the night. We'll talk more about the weekend, help you prepare. And also, our next chance of rain is just around the corner. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. In the buzz today, rock and roll legend Jerry Lee Lewis has passed away. The piano-pounding, foot-stomping singer known for hits like Great Balls of Fire and a whole lot of shaking going on died at his home today in Mississippi. His seventh wife, Judith, says he died of natural causes and she was by his side when it happened. In his final days, he told her he welcomed the hereafter and that he was not afraid. Jerry Lee Lewis was 87 years old. Definitely lived a full life. Well, this right here, that's a done deal. NFL star quarterback Tom Brady and Giselle Boonshin announced on Instagram that they have finalized their divorce after 13 years of marriage. Brady wrote, quote, we arrived at this decision amicably and with gratitude for the time that we spent together. We will continue to work together as parents. Boonshin echoed that his, his statement saying, quote, the decision to end a marriage is never easy, but we have grown apart. I feel blessed for the time we have had together and only wish the best for Tom always. The two have been living separately and both hired divorce attorneys after months of tension reportedly over Brady's decision to return to the NFL after initially retiring last winter couple has two children together. This is an awesome story. A wrong turn down a residential street in Nebraska was the right move for a sleeping fa for a family. Brendan Burt says that he was driving, made a U-turn, and that's when he saw a house going up in flames. He began yelling. He was banging on the windows. And with that, he woke up three kids and their adult brother who were asleep in that home. In the video, you see them making a break for it, running through the flames on the front porch, just in the nick of the time. Mom there hugging the savior there and the hero. The house was destroyed, but the family again is alive thanks to a good Samaritan who was in the right place at the right time. And just made a, a, a wrong turn. Jeez. Destiny, fate. Now, just in time for Halloween, today is National Chocolate Day. It's time to celebrate one of the world's favorite treats. Chocolate. <laughs> yes, it comes from fermented and roasted cacao seeds from Mexico and Central and South America. Now, you know this. Chocolate has a lot of different iterations, including unsweetened milk, white, dark, although white chocolate's not really chocolate. Let's be real. Now, our newsroom definitely loves chocolate. We definitely didn't want for today. You know, Halloween has really been an excuse to... Put away bags and bags of chocolate candy since the beginning of the month, and it has definitely been quite the experience. Now, we already have people walk around the newsroom with the big bags of candy. Yeah. Can't avoid it. Just like candy, as a carved pumpkin is a Halloween staple, if you haven't made one yet, a carving hack is going viral. It's saving people lots of time. 73-year-old carving consultant Barbara Costello took to TikTok with some awesome tips. And did you hear that? She's a carving consultant. It's a great job to have. Yeah, I want that <laughs> title. Now she says that carving your pumpkin from, that you should carve it from the bottom instead of the top. And for quick cleaning and seed removal, you should use a hand mixer to mash and then soften things up. And then you just scoop it out. Then you use cookie cutters to design a face and then Vaseline to prolong its life. Cause you know, when they get really old and ugly. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, well, now we know what to do. Now a 16 year old quote, <laughs> Halloween influencer taking the holiday to the next level. Miles McCabe, AKA Brick Thunder, is the mastermind behind this massive Halloween display in Chicago. It has more than 100 animatronics moving about and making all sounds of festive sounds. That's right. McCabe says that he's been collecting animatronics since he was nine years old. That's why you see he's got all that <laughs> stuff. And his vision for Halloween has only grown over the years. And his display is actually so popular that it has show times starting tomorrow through Monday. Plus, he has two versions. He has a family friendly one and one that he calls darker, scarier, you know, but you want kids to be able to enjoy it, too. So you go to the family. So real one. question, <laughs> which one would you go to? Definitely the family friendly one. I don't need to see all that stuff. It's all right. I take the scary one. Yeah, let's go all out. Come on. I knew that was coming. Living out. Yep. Yeah.
That's definitely live on the edge a little. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have a lot of weather to talk about. We had some good rainfall earlier this morning. Windy and cool tonight, feeling very fall like throughout the weekend and actually running below average in terms of temperatures tomorrow morning or tomorrow all day. Another chance of rain is just around the corner. That's going to be here by Tuesday. So let's talk about these rain chances and we have that one little blip. Tuesday, 40% chance, so scattered category. And of course, we'll be updating this forecast and fine tuning it as the days go by and we get more info. So check back in for updates in terms of the um, coverage of rain we're expecting and of course, the timing and how much we could actually get. Earlier today, we had some good rain. Take a look at this. This is Southern Bear County. This is what we like to see. Look at that, a good solid inch of rain in the rain gauge, Southern Bear County there. And you look at our drought monitor. This was updated yesterday. Obviously, we need the rain, especially locally. We've got the extreme and exceptional drought around Bear County and surrounding counties as well. But the rain moved on through. It was beneficial. It's helpful. It's not going to be a drought buster, but a little drought denter. It's good to have. And then we have another opportunity, as I mentioned, as we go into Tuesday. So we're looking forward to that. Here's the big picture. Still areas of rain, parts of North and East Texas. That's where the bulk of the moisture is and the bulk of the energy associated with it. It's just that rain is going to be it's more prolonged up there. So they're picking up a few inches of rain from this. So at least somebody's getting in on some really good soaking rainfall because the whole state needs it right now. And at least some folks are getting it. It's kind of clockwise swirl. That's the upper level low. This is moving out of our area, but it's going to be replaced by another one. It's going to dig southward, drop into northern Mexico and West Texas on Monday, Halloween. Give us a decent amount of cloud cover, I think, for Halloween, but the rain should hold off until Tuesday. Maybe some showers late at night on Halloween. That's something we'll be watching for, but I think most of it will hold off until Tuesday. Future cast is even showing that. I think this future cast is a little too aggressive with it right now, but We'll cross our fingers that this one actually verifies because we'd like to see that kind of coverage, wouldn't we? 70 degrees, that's our temperature right now. Dew point of 49, nice fall evening out there. Just gusty. If you're going to Friday night football or trunk or treat, any activities, northwesterly wind steady at 13, gusting between 20 and 30 miles per hour. You look at the latest wind gusts, and Stinson's been gusting up to 24 most recently. Uvalde, 21 miles per hour. Los Maples gusting to 26. And even a 35 mile per hour gust recently clocked in Del Rio. And we'll be dealing with this gusty wind through the night and even into tomorrow. Notice our future cast here and our forecast for the wind gusts from 8 p.m. tonight to 4 a.m. tomorrow morning. We could see some gusts periodically close to 30 miles per hour. All right, let's talk temperatures. We're going to be below average tomorrow. How's that? Rock Springs at 61. Fredericksburg already down to 60. Kennedy 71. We're 70 in Divine and 64 now in Bernie. Officially in town, we're at 70 degrees. But tomorrow morning, this is what the map should look like. Some upper 40s in the hill country. Bulverde 48 along with Bernie. Port SA on the west side about 53. And I think around most of San Antonio, 52 to start the day. And then we just warm up 20 degrees into the lower 70s, about 72 the high temperature we think officially in town, a few degrees warmer as you get farther to the south on the south side. Here's a case at 12 hour forecast, partly cloudy through the first half of the day, 52 degrees at 6 and 7 a.m. And then by noon, we're up to 65. Jacket weather in the morning, by the afternoon, with the vast sunshine, I don't think you'll need a jacket. By 5 o'clock, we're up to 72 degrees for the high temperature. And looking ahead, Sunday, very similar, 50 in the morning, Upper 70s by the afternoon, a lot of sunshine, not as breezy. Monday Halloween, 77 the high, and I think during trick-or-treating, we'll be falling through the 70s with low humidity. We'll be right back in just a bit. It is Friday, October 28th. The trial of Jessica Briones continues today as the defense arrested their case just a few hours ago. She's on trial for the death of her four-year-old daughter. On September 5th of 2017, Briones walked into a police station with her daughter who was unresponsive. The child died a day later and doctors found numerous injuries, old and new throughout her body. Briones is accused of murder and faces life in prison if the jury finds her guilty. 
UT Health San Antonio, which is the state's main distributor of Narcan, sent a supply of it to the BCSO. The sheriff's office is then going to give it to its deputies. Sheriff Javier Salazar says that it really came at the perfect time because just today, he says deputies got a call about a man who overdosed but was saved once someone gave him Narcan. Now, Sheriff Salazar also says that with this new supply, most deputies should have two doses of Narcan on hand while they're on patrol. Elon Musk is the owner of Twitter. After going through his original $44 billion deal, he actually tweeted out, the bird is freed. Didn't waste any time making changes. Before he could get his name on the door, he fired the CEO and CFO, along with several other top execs. He has said he would cut the workforce by 75%. Musk has said also that he's about free speech, free expression of ideas. Musk said he bought Twitter to help humanity. Right now, people with nightmare disorders are treated using imagery rehearsal therapy. It teaches people to reimagine their nightmares with positive endings. It doesn't work for everyone, but a new twist on that therapy adds sound, and it appears to have yielded improved results. It involves sounds the sufferer associates with more positive outcome. The sound is played as the person is in REM sleep. Beautiful fall-like weekend, mornings right near 50, afternoons in the low to mid 70s for the most part. Also a decent amount of sunshine. You will notice the wind on Saturday at times gusting up to 30 miles per hour. By Sunday, not much of a breeze, just a lot of sunshine and comfortable temperatures. Of course, low humidity all weekend. That's going to last into Halloween, 77 the high temperature, trick-or-treating in the 70s on Monday. Okay, and we're excited to see y'all at Muertos Fest this weekend. Thanks for joining us. Night beat. we'll see you then.